Um, so let's, let's get started here. We should finish this section off today and then as I posted on the course website, the notes for the next section, we'll be able to start that as well uh, in today's class. So we were looking at screens and particle size characterization in the previous class. So I handed these around. Did everyone get a chance to see them last time? Did they make it all the way up to the back? Yeah? Um, so the, this section is not really separations related. Um, it's loosely separations related because, of course, you're separating larger particle sizes from smaller particle sizes. But there's not really anything that's mathematically or conceptually com complex about that. But the reason why I do cover this topic is because as I said in last class, up to now, we've always assumed in engineering everything is the same size. You deal with catalyst pellets in Dr. Mashkar's three, uh, 4K class. He'll talk about catalyst pellets that are all of the same diameter. Or you deal with mass transfer in a packed column, you assume the packing in the column is all the same size. But we really don't ever have that, right? We know that from real life experience. It would be almost a physical impossibility if everything was the identical size. <laughs> um, so what we do is we characterize our particles. And when we use this term characterization, this is another term that you'll hear in your career, not just in um, solids processing, but in any area. When they talk about characterization, it's just an they're trying to sound impressive. They're just saying, describe. Give a description of the solids. So we're trying to characterize the solids or describe the solids. And where we will go today is we will describe our solids with a distribution. So we'll say, if we look at our particles on a distribution scale, so this might be a percentage scale on the vertical axis, and the horizontal is the diameter, micrometers, we're going to come up with that distribution. And the way we do that is we use a sequence of screens. So as shown here in the, in the diagram, and as said last class, we'll stack those screens from the largest diameter screens at the top with the larger holes. And near the bottom, we'll have very, very fine openings. And then the very last screen really isn't a screen. It's a very small um, height pan, just a solid pan that will catch anything that um, passes through the smallest screen. So we stack those vertically, we shake it. Some cases we may need to apply water or some liquid to wash the smaller particles off the larger ones. Those very fine particles will stick to the larger particles. So we wash through and get good separation. We dry th those solids because we're going to weigh them afterwards. So that's why these are made from metal. So you can put them in ovens afterwards. Dry the, dry the solids from the moisture and then you weigh the, weigh the amounts. And once you've weighed those, we can create that third column. So the first two columns, those we know, these are characteristics of our screen. So for example, this is a number 10 mesh screen. Uh, I don't have a number 10 on here. Uh, let's maybe take this one. This is a number 70 screen. So it's over there. So it says the aperture of the screen is 212. In fact, it's printed here on the screen for us. Each hole is 212 micrometers in in, in in opening size, and when we weigh the amount of solids on the screen, we might get to 22 grams, mass retained. And as I said last class, what we really have to recognize is that the solids that rest on top of the screen are not 212 micrometers. They're larger than 212, okay? So I gave this uh, description visually. We can see there's two, two successive screens these solids here are going to be larger. These are going to be a little bit smaller. And if this is my 212 screen, and the next one above it is the 300 micron screen, these particles are 300 microns and greater. These particles are 212 microns and greater. So in fact, these particles over here are somewhere between 212 and 300 micrometers. So what we typically report then is the average. So those solids are not... 212, they're not 300. What we'll say is those 22 grams of solids we, we get on that screen, they're an average size of 256. So just use the, the average of the two. Okay. So we can now create this new column of average sizes, a new column of mass retained. And once you have mass 
and average size, you can start to create one of these graphs that gives a distribution. And what we will do is, if we plot our data, we can typically present it in two ways. So let me just uh, take that table of data that was there on the prior slide and show it to you. The typical way we can see it is simply as a distribution. So simply plot the mass on each screen against the particle size or the average particle size. So we see here very quickly our largest diameter in terms of mass percentage mass is around over here. So let's go back to our table. In terms of percentage mass, there's our largest mass, 235 grams, corresponds to an average size of 725 microns. Okay. As I showed last class, you can visually see that mass retained column over there forms, you can eyeball it, sort of forms a distribution lying on its side. Right. And that's the actual distribution shown over here in the next slide for you. We can also now calculate the cumulative distribution. So if you, any, you'll recall from your stats course, any distribution that looks like that, you can calculate the cumulative sum of it, which will then sum up like that. So that's the green curve, the cumulative sum. And it has this typical S shape. Or we can look at one minus that curve. The green curve is the percentage passing. What percentage of solids pass through the screen of that diameter? Well, if it's not passing, the opposite of passing is being retained, we can then interpret the blue curve as the percentage retained. Okay, so the cumulative percentage retained. So either one of those three representations you're likely to encounter in practice. The percentage retained, percentage passing, or the differential. If you want to look at it purely from a theoretical algebraic perspective, this curve over here, the differential curve, is essentially the derivative of the green curve. So if you took the derivative of the green curve, df by dx, you get to the differential curve, which is, again, where that name comes from. Okay. So let's try this out with a very trivial example. Um, I'm going to give you some numbers here, not so many as in the table. And I'd like you to come up with the cumulative percentage passing. So if we did a lab experiment, here's our mesh size. See if you can just visualize what these, these data look like. So visualize for mesh 8, 14. So those are our, our four screens and then the pan. The aperture sizes for those are 2380 microns, 1680, 425, 105. And obviously the pan has zero aperture. And after doing those experiments, you get mass retained. So these would be in grams. And the mass retained is zero in the first screen. As I mentioned last time, you should always get zero mass retained on that first screen. So always keep adding larger and larger screens until your first screen has no mass retained. And that way, when you calculate that average, you get a fair number. The second screen can, uh, has 10 grams, then 60 grams. I'm choosing really easy numbers, so you can, uh, don't even need a calculator for this. Okay. So go ahead then and, and and try to plot a differential analysis plot. So your goal here is a differential analysis. You can show it as a bar graph as well. It's often a really good way to show that differential analysis. Or you can do, um, if you'd like to take that further and do a cumulative analysis. So let's just work with a cumulative 
passing. We'll just do one of the cumulative diagrams. Doesn't need to be an accurate sketch, just get a rough idea of what's going on with that. The first thing that always throws people is where to start with this table in Excel or so that, let's just do it by hand and get some good practice. Is it going here, guys? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But what always throws people is which two rows do you take the averages yeah. between? Yeah. Any problems, concerns, questions? Everyone got it figured out? What goes in what rows and columns?
Okay, it looks like most of you have. Uh, the first column that you should calculate then, of course, is the average size column. And I'm going to just add that to this end of the table. So there's average size in microns. The first tray has no mass retained. We don't really calculate an average size for it. There's nothing bigger than it, so we don't report anything there. And so we calculate the average between these two values, 2380, 1680, and the average there is 2030 microns. The next average is between 1680 and 425. Now that's a huge distance, right? And this is because I'm using a very simple example with only four rows. Typically, you'd have eight or ten of these, and you'd get a, um, you wouldn't space your mesh sizes so far apart. The distance between 1680 microns and 425 is huge. Okay? You're lumping a whole lot of mass together there, which um, wouldn't otherwise be done. But this is an uh, artificial example for class and to do by hand. 1680 plus 425, the average of that is 1052. The next average between 425 and 105 is 265. And then your final average is 52. Okay. Once we have mass retained, we, um, we can now go ahead and try and plot, as I said, if the first one is the differential plot. We've got enough information now to do so. The differential plot, we need the average size and we need the, um, the, the mass retained. So let's go do that here quick. The differential bar plot, we would plot then on the micrometer scale, the horizontal axis at the point Let's start from the bottom of the table and work up. So at 52 microns, we're saying our mass retained then is 5 grams. And we can plot it on a mass basis on the vertical axis, or we can plot it on a percentage basis. So 5, and this summation is 100, and that was intentional, just so our calculations are a little quicker. But so 5 grams divided by 100 grams is 5%. So 5% of my solids are in this range. Then the next bar would be at 265. And there we had mass retained of 25%. The next bar would be at uh, 1052. So I'm going to run out of space on the scale. That's another thing you start to notice is that there's almost there's not an even spacing over here. And so sometimes people will plot these on a logarithmic axis. And that next bar would be 60%. And then somewhere over there, your final bar would be the, the last category with 10% mass retained. Okay, so somewhere over here. There's 10% and that's at 2030 microns. So differential analysis go, go are very easily calculated from the table. The next one is I'd ask you to calculate the percentage cumulative, so I should reword that as cumulative percentage passing. Um, intuitively it says, let's just take a look at this aperture size, 2380. What percentage of your mass passed through the screen with the whole size 2380. 100% of your mass passed through there because you're left with zero grams on that screen. Okay, so the interpretation of that column, cumulative percent passing, is, is quite intuitive. If we were looking at cumulative percentage retained, it's just as intuitive. Cumulative percentage retained is nothing more Let's perhaps add it here for ourselves. So this column, I'm going to just add it here. Cumulative percentage retained is 0 divided by 100, 0%. 10 divided by 100 is 10%, but it's cumulative. So 10 plus the prior entry of 0. 60 divided by 100% was retained, but the cumulative then is 60 plus the prior value of 10. 
The next one would be 25 plus 60 plus 10, and you get the, you get the idea. Okay, so this column I've added here for was cumulative percent retained. And the column I had asked you to calculate, though, was cumulative percent passing. Cumulative percent passing is just 100 minus this value that we've calculated. Or intuitively, what is the percentage that's passed through that screen? Well, 100% has passed through that screen. If 10% was retained, well, then 90% must have passed from a mass balance perspective. 60 was retained, 40 passed, 25, 75, 95. Whoops, what did I do wrong there? I suddenly switched my <laughs> frame of reference. So 40, uh, 190, 40, I need to be going down. And then the last one. I'm going to look it up. 35 and 0. Sorry, 190. I switched over there. There we go. <laughs> OK, so set that up most easily in an Excel spreadsheet. Most companies will already have a template for this set up. Um, what you'll find, though, is companies have very specific ways that they like to present this. For example, in the pharmaceutical industry, they want these plots shown in the same way all the time, and so they have Excel templates for that purpose used. So just ask for those from your laboratory staff and they'll, they'll get it to you. Okay, so from a theoretical perspective then, on the left we've got our function f of x, that's the frequency distribution, or simply the differential curve. If you integrate that, so take this function f of x and you integrate it, go from left to right, you'll get the cumulative distribution. Conversely, you take the cumulative distribution and you differentiate it, you get back to the other one. Okay, so, so either perspective works, but often, as I'll argue, that the plot on the left gives you the most informative information. It's actually very hard um, to visualize cumulative plots and see the details over there. For example, in a cumulative plot, you wouldn't pick up very easily if the distribution was bimodal. Okay. A bimodal distribution shows up very clearly in this sort of plot, but in a cumulative plot you just see a small bump, but it's not obvious what's going on. So differential plots are helpful to, to see that. Now, the way these plots are often used is very, very confusing. And I don't want to go into it because what, what each area seems to do is have their own type of average. So the polymer area, they'll have a particular average. In process control, when we're looking at controlling particle sizes, we'll calculate a different average. And each industry seems to have their own specific weighted sum of calculating averages. So I don't want to go through them. There's many descriptions here over, over, a, over a large chapter in this textbook of illustrating the various averages that can be calculated. My goal for you is to impress on you that given that distribution, you would probably say to someone else, the average is around 700 microns, okay? But for different industries where maybe the area of the particle means something more important than the diameter itself, you would calculate a different weighted sum mean. So the formulas for these, there's many of them. They're complex, they're filled with summation signs, and they really don't um, benefit us for the purpose of this course. Other than to illustrate that there's a variety of averages. So which means should you use? Um, well, use what's appropriate is really the, the answer to that. If you're dealing with volumes, in other words, maybe you're considering how, how many particles you can pack in a, in a packed column, well then the volume-based mean diameter is applicable. If you're dealing with mass transfer calculations or reactor design calculations. It's the area that's useful. And so there's a different mean that you can calculate it called the surface mean diameter. Okay. So, so that's, um, that's the general principle for this section. 
there's an illustration of one, two, three, four, five, six different types of means and how they uh, relate to a particular distribution. Okay, so we won't go into that detail. What I will also end off with this section is sampling. Just a quick comment on sampling. Sampling is something that is phenomenally difficult to do properly. There's, in, there's many books on that and an experienced person in your company should be consulted on this. If you're going to a process and dealing with solids and you want to take a sample, go ask for advice. That's my biggest uh, like concern for you for this class. Ask for advice on this topic because you obviously cannot take the entire the whole stream as your sample, right? That's clear. So we have to take some subset of it. But do you dip your container into a part of the stream and then quickly take a sample? Or do you do that multiple times and then accumulate those smaller samples and add them up? Or should you cut the entire stream? So what I mean by that is if you've got material flowing so there's, a, there's maybe a, a pipe and it's flowing in and out of the board, so the material's flowing this way. You take a container and you take a sample just from this portion of the stream. But the advice in general is if you're taking a sample from a moving stream, sample the entire stream, take all the quantity flowing through that cross section for a period of time. It's, often it's difficult to do, but that is often the most representative sample. The reason why this is not a good idea is because you've got smaller particles traveling over here and larger particles down here, which you may never then reach with that sample. So the general advice is try to get a snapshot of the entire volume for a short period of time, and that's a good representative sample. The other advice that's often uh, given is to do that process multiple times, combine it in a bag, mix it up, and then you take a sample from that bag. Of, so a sample of your samples. Okay, but just taking a single grab from a subset of the stream is usually going to give you an inaccurate sample. Okay. Any questions on this topic of size distributions and before we move on?